Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to Information Economics. Today we want to use our videos to give you some ideas about this particular problem, channel selection under competition. Um, basically, this is a topic that we choose uh, for the following purpose. First, I want to give you a particular application of game theoretic modeling. Okay, we're going to use combine your knowledge about game theory or game theoretic models to study a specific problem. Okay, this one, and <coughs> show you some um, insights there. The second reason for we to discuss this is to illustrate the idea about incentives. Okay, we want to give you, uh, we want to tell you what's the impact of incentives and what's the role played by incentives in all kinds of different decentralized systems. We will go to details later. So, in overall, I want to first tell you what's the problem we want to address, or I should say the two authors of this particular paper want to address. The topic, the, the, the materials we will go over today are mainly adapted from a paper written by two authors. Okay, so I will first introduce the problem, and then how do we model that problem, and then how do we analyze that problem, and finally, what are the intuitions or implications we can get from the analysis or the whole study. So, <clears throat> let's start. As I mentioned, we want to see how game theoretic modeling may be applied and here we want to study a marketing problem, okay? This is a channel selection problem. What's that? As a brand owner or as a, a guy who produces products, eventually you want to ask how to reach your consumers, okay? This is definitely a question you want to ask. Do you sell to consumers directly? Uh, I mean, do you mail the product to the consumers? Or do you set up a store so that consumers may come and shop and buy? Or do you hire a salespeople to go to a salesperson to go to each store, knock the store and promote the product? No. Or an online store? There are definitely many different ways to reach your product consumers. And McGuire and Staley, they, they wrote a paper in 1983 to address this question. Later we will see what are the specific part of this question. Okay? When we want to study a problem, we got to get a focus. Later we will see what's the focus. And then we want to show you what's the incentive issue there and as a decentralization and as a decentralized system, what are the efficiency or inefficiency issues there. Finally, we want to show you that Economic modeling may deliver non-trivial insights to you. Okay, so far, if you recall what we did in the previous lecture, we studied a lot of game theoretic models, right? Uh, corner competition, uh, version competition, uh, multiple layers in a supply chain, and so on and so on. They are used for us to confirm some intuitions we have. Okay, nothing was surprised there, but here. We are trying to show you that when we can model a more complicated environment, then we may find something that cannot be um, imagined before we really do the analysis. Okay? You probably feel that's true or not after I go through everything, but we will see what's going to happen. Okay, so the question is here. I want to select a distribution channel. Okay? That's a fundamental marketing problem for me to reach my consumer. Okay, this is typically a brand owner's problem, or here we're going to call it a manufacturer. I want to decide how to deliver products to end consumers. So some options are here. Okay, selling through independent retailers, or selling through franchise stores. Okay, or I may operate my own retail store or I may operate my own outlet. Outlet and retail stores are somewhat different. Or I may operate an online store and the direct delivery. 
Okay, there are multiple ways. In general, we can roughly categorize a channel into either direct or indirect. For direct case, that means I, as a manufacturer, I reach consumers directly by myself. For example, if I own a retail store, then we say it's a direct channel because I decide the retail price there. I decide how many um, personnel to hire in the store. I decide um, what should be placed, what should be stored in those uh, retail stores. Okay, Then it's just my store. I treat it as a direct channel. But if I sell to independent retailers, then retailers will make their own decisions, and then that becomes an indirect channel. A direct channel is integrated, while an indirect channel is decentralized. Okay, We're going to compare these two kinds of channels later in today's video. Sometimes we may mix different distribution channels, right? As a manufacturer, it's very often today that they sell to independent retailers, and they also open, for example, their online stores. Okay, so that's definitely possible. Okay, mix distribution channels. Today, we're going to assume, we're going to focus on a basic problem without mixed distribution channels. Probably you want to think uh, this is a paper written in 1983. Okay, it's not so common or it's just, there's just no online stores there. So let's forget it for a while. So direct and indirect channels, if you are talking about this, what are the benefits or the cost for adapting an indirect or direct channel? As a direct channel owner, the best thing you may want to get is to understand end consumers, right? This is definitely helpful if you want to modify or design your products accordingly. So understanding and consumers may be a reason for operating a direct channel. Or if we take that uh, away for a while, just think about uh, game theory or just think about uh, economics. In fact, if I am able to control everything or if I can do complete integration, basically that should be optimal for me, right? If you think about corner competition, Bertrand competition, whatever competition, for firms, it's always better if there is no competition. If I am a manufacturer, somehow, um, if I can control the retailer, I would try to do that. Because there is no reason for the retailer to make some decisions that I don't like and also share the profit from me. Okay. So if I, pre if I can control, I should actually do complete integration and operate a direct channel, right? So that's the first intuition we have. But unfortunately, we are observing so many indirect channels in, in practice. So why? Sometimes the manufacturer just has no choice. If I, producing, if I am producing products, for example, in Taiwan, but I want to sell to Africa, then I just know nothing at, about Africa. Then probably I need to find someone to help me selling the product there. That's some possible reasons. Or sometimes the retailer just can do a better work than you. Okay, A retailer may have better reputation. A retailer may do better marketing. Or the retailer may attract more consumers because the retailer aggregates multiple products or multiple brands from multiple manufacturers. And then that multiple offers is able to attract consumers. If you are opening your own retail store, your competitors will not be able, will not be willing to sell their products to you, right? So an independent retailer in this case is helpful. Sometimes a retailer may do better forecasting, or sometimes a retailer is an expert in offering better consumer services. So there are all kinds of possible reasons for an independent retailer to be beneficial, right? So there are some basic trade-offs. Everyone can name a few. However, suppose I want to study this problem. Where should I start? Uh, which point should I start with? That's the question I want to ask. Suppose I write a paper. And I use a very complicated model. 
to study a lot of weird things, and eventually I show a direct channel is better than an indirect channel, then this is not going to be an interesting finding, right? Because this is somewhat just trivial. Complete integration is just optimal. Okay? If I say something is good because there is some obvious reason, then it's not an interesting finding or it's not a valuable finding. Or how about this? I show that a franchise store is better than a self-owned store. Or I should say, if I find an indirect channel is better than direct channel, well, does that um, make the, pro the finding interesting? It depends on the reason I discover. Suppose I say, okay, a, retail a retailer makes me more profitable because the retailer can sell more than me. Then that's again trivial, right? That's again trivial. If the reason for me to sell to a retailer is because the retailer can sell more, then the finding is just trivial. No one cares about that finding. Okay? So what's really interesting? What's really interesting is that if I have a model or if I study an environment in which the manufacturer is as strong as the retailer in selling products and also integration is not optimal, then the reason or the result I discover may become interesting or at least non-trivial. Okay? Huh. Think about this again. I study an environment or I create an environment. In that environment, the manufacturer can do the selling business as good as the retailer. Okay? There is no reputation issue. There is no forecasting issue. There is no service issue. Whatever the retailer can do, the manufacturer can copy it and do as good as the retailer. But then I still show that integration is not optimal. Then you probably want to ask why? If you want to ask why, then that's a good study. So when is vertical integration suboptimal? McGuire and Staling in this classical paper, they show it is indeed possible. Okay? The question they are asking is about the number of intermediary in a distribution channel. Suppose, and they say, suppose the manufacturer sells through a company store, then it's zero level or integration. Or if the manufacturer sells to a franchise store, then it's decentralization. Okay. One thing to keep in mind here is that we are not really considering independent retailers. Okay? If there is an independent retailer, that guy is going to sell products from multiple manufacturers. But we are not considering that situation. We are considering whether to open a store by ourselves or to sell to a franchise store. Okay? That guy join my company somehow huh? join my company by opening a read and operating a retail store he sells only my product okay so this makes the problem um purely a selection of level of intermediary whether i want to own the retail store or i want to let some guy to own the retail store huh? that's the question and then they show and uh, they, they assume that the intermediary is equally good no matter whether it's manufacturer running it or another guy, the franchise store running it. Okay. So based on this uh, setting and particularly this assumption, they are going to give you a reason for inserting one level of intermediary. Okay. There is going to be a reason for you not to touch or not to reach the consumers directly. We're going to see what's that. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at the model. As, I always, as we always want to do, we see a problem, and then we try to use the model to describe that problem. A model is a good thing in the perspective that we are going to describe the problem in details and precisely okay previously 
Let's say in the previous video, when I describe a problem in words, there are all kinds of possibilities. There are all kinds of different problems that fit my description. But after I give the model description, it's done. Okay, it can only be one problem. So let's see what's the problem precisely. Okay, as I mentioned in the previous video, this is a problem studying exclusive retail stores. Okay, so I don't care about those real retailers. There is no such option. I don't want to sell to retail options. I want to either sell my own product by running my company store or sell through franchise stores. Let's uh, see what's happening here. One example about the, 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 this kind of channel is gasoline. Okay? At least in the United States, many gasoline stores or gas stations are franchise stores. Okay? The, 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 the company does not really own that gas station. It's some other guy running that gas station, and he has the power to, for example, set the price or to order the amount of oils stored in the station. Okay, So gasoline may be a franchise store, but as you may understand, there are also many gas, uh, gas stations that are company stores. Whatever, uh, whether it is a company store or franchise store, for gas stations, they are exclusive retail stores. Okay, when you go to one brand of gas station, there is no other brand of gas for you to buy there. For automobiles, it's the same thing. Okay, I'm hi highlighting these are new automobiles. If you go to Toyota. Then you may also you may only buy Toyota there. There is no way for you to buy Honda or Ford. For fast food is the same thing. Okay, McDonald's, McDonald's, uh, it may open many company stores owned by himself, or some uh, independent guys may join the brand of McDonald's and open franchise stores. Okay, both exist in the world, but they are exclusive. You just cannot buy any Kentucky chickens in McDonald's, and so on and so on. Okay, so we are talking about exclusive retail stores, and then the paper want to search for conditions under which I can see the industrial equilibrium has zero or one level or of intermediary. Okay, uh, here um probably we should say zero or or one. Okay, sometimes we're going to see one level of intermediary. Sometimes we're going to see no level of intermediary. Okay, here, how many levels is decided by the manufacturer? The manufacturer decides whether it is more profitable to sell through a franchise store or whether it is more profitable to sell through a company store. This is not fixed. It is chosen by the manufacturer. Chosen by the manufacturers. In this problem, there is a market. In the market, there are two manufacturers. Okay, these two manufacturers somehow corresponds to two firms or two brands. They are selling different but substitutable products, and that means uh, if I want to buy this product, some. Somewhat, I can also buy the other product as a substitute. It is assumed that they are price setters, so they are going to set the prices for their products, and then the product demand will depend on both prices. Okay, if the other guy's pr price goes up, then my demand is also going to goes up because my product becomes relatively more attractive. So if both of them choose no intermediary, or if both of them choose direct channels, then they are exactly playing a Bertrand game or Bertrand competition. We mentioned it to you in the previous lecture. And then, suppose each of them choose to work with a retailer or a 
franchise store. Then in that case, they are having one level of intermediary. Then the manufacturer sets the wholesale price, and the retailer sets the retail price. And then the two players in the channel will play the channel pricing game, or the supply chain pricing game we mentioned in the previous lecture. So it's it's just that the manufacturer sets the wholesale price, and then the retailer sells the resale price, and then consumers see the two retail prices, and then demand realizes. Each of them is going to decide whether to downwards vertically integrate. What does that mean? Which of them knows there must be a retail store for its product, but each manufacturer needs to decide whether to downwards integrate that retail store. If I want to integrate, then I am running a direct channel. I am running my own company store. But if I don't do that, if I choose not to vertically integrate, then there will be a franchise store there. So. As we have two channels, in total we have three possible industry structures: pure integration, pure decentralization, or mixed. What are them? Uh, suppose, as a manufacturer, okay, manufacturer one, manufacturer two, if both of them want to reach customers directly, then this is called pure integration. Okay, they they are just two integrated channels. Or, if both manufacturers choose to delegate to a retailer, okay, and then retailers reach customers, then this is a pure decentralization channel, or we call we abbreviate it as DD, uh, decentralization and decentralization. Again, uh, don't forget. As a retailer, this is an exclusive retailer, so manufacturer two does not sell to retailer one. Also, here, in this case, we are not actually saying that the manufacturers reaches consumers directly. There is still a store, okay? There is still a store. It's just that the manufacturers controls the store. Finally, it's also possible that manufacturer one choose to reach customers directly. But manufacturer two choose to delegate to a retailer, right? In this case, we call it ID. Similarly, we may have DI if manufacturer one uses a retailer, but manufacturer two does the uh, does an um, indirect channel. So in total, we have four kinds of structures, but two of them are just an opposite to each other. So we can see that this is a dynamic game. With embedded st static games, or vice versa, we can also say this is a static games with embedded dynamic games. Okay. For example, here, suppose both of them choose to use DD, and then, as manufacturer one, I need to choose my wholesale price. Manufacturer then also choose his retail price. Uh, sorry, wholesale price. So at stage one, these two guys. Play a static game, and then in stage two, these two guys play another static game, and then everything will realize. So this is a particular situation where we say this is a dynamic game because there are two stages, but in each stage there are two guys making decisions together. Okay, so we are really looking at. A combination of bird chain competition and the supply chain pricing. Okay, uh, these are the what's interesting here. We are combining the two basic models you learned in the previous lecture to become this one. Some more details. Suppose I am using ID, then、um, you can see there will still be two stages, right? But In one stage, there is only one decision maker, but in the other stage, there is another.、Uh, there are two decision makers. So there are many combinations of this game. So let's、um, give you more details about the model. There are two manufacturers. Each manufacturer has a downstream retail store. Okay, the retail store is either a company store or a franchise store. Don't forget, this is 
what can be chosen by the manufacturer. The manufacturer can decide either this one or that one. And then the demand facing retail stores 1 and 2 are following this formula. Exactly what you have observed in a Bertrand competition. Okay, so to make it simple, we say this is 1 minus P1 plus theta P2 with theta as a degree of substitutability. When theta goes up, that means these two products become more similar. And then my price is going to affect your demand more. When theta is very small, for example, zero, then there is no, there is just no interaction between these two products. Okay, as we all know, it's reasonable for theta to be smaller than one. Okay, because my price should affect my demand more than your price does. Okay, so that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, finally, there is one thing I want to remind you. If you look at the paper, the paper actually starts with a more general model. And then the paper do some reductions and reformulations to show you that that more general model can actually be expressed like this. Okay? So this is not really simplifying too much. This allows us to uh, ignore some tedious mathematical notations and derivations. But this is going to provide all the insights we need. If they are playing an II game, then this is just Bertrand competition. So retail, a manufacturer I says retail price I by solving this particular problem. Okay, huh. P is the price, Q is the demand. As we assume, oh, I forgot to tell you, we assume there is no cost because it doesn't really matter. Okay, so the manufacturer one's problem is going to solve P1 and uh, P1 times Q1, manufacturer two P2 times Q2. And then this is manufacturer's integrated profit. Okay. Suppose they are playing DD. Then in the first stage, manufacturer I is going to choose the wholesale price I to maximize the profit. Here, Q somewhat needs the manufacturer's prediction. Because in the second stage, the retailer is going to set the retail price and to maximize the retailer's profit itself. Okay? Under DD, the manufacturer cannot choose the retail price. The retailer will choose the retail price. And PI minus WI is the profit margin. QI is the demand. Again, QI is, this, is affected by PI and PJ. And then PI MI and the PI RI are the profits of the manufacturer and the retailer. Um, under DD, or, I, or more precisely, the manufacturers and the retailers' profits in channel I, if we are talking about PI MI and the PI RI. Finally, it's possible for Lay to choose ID, right? So, first, the manufacturer 2 is going to set the wholesale price W2, okay? Because manufacturer 2 choose decentralization, so manufacturer must play the wholesale price decision first. And then the manufacturer 1 and the retailer 2 is go are going to set the retail prices by solving their problems um, to maximize their profits. If it's DI, then it's the opposite. Okay? So in any case, under any of the four um, market structure, we know what's the game sequence. And then and then go back to the very beginning. The two firms must think about what's going to happen in any of the four market structures. So they will choose D or I by themselves independently. And then it happens that one of the in, uh, market structures will realize and then they start to play the, the game or more precisely this is manufacturer 1, this is manufacturer 2 manufacturer 1 can choose I or D, manufacturer 2 can choose I or D if it happens that both of them choose here then they play the II game in the sequel or if they choose here then they play the DD game oh, player 1 and player 2 plays this channel selection game at the very beginning. After that, they all 
uh, observe um, their own and the other guy's channel structure, and then they play the pricing game. Okay, so that's the whole structure. As we all know, we need to use backward induction. So given any in industry structure, we need to find their equilibrium prices and the profits. And that's what I will do in the next video. And then go back to the very first beginning. We can find the equilibrium industry structures. That's really what we want to do. It's about the industry structures or market structures. We want to ask under this particular scenario, in this environment, is it possible for DD or ID or DI to be a Nash equilibrium? Okay, is it possible for them to choose to be decentralized directly and uh, selfishly? Okay, we want to know whether a profit maximizing uh, manufacturer will choose to do decentralization. Okay, so that's the model. Thank you. Okay, so now let's study the pricing game of the, uh, the problem we study. Okay, as we mentioned, at the very first beginning, these two players make their channel selection decision. After that, they observe the channel structures. They know it's either DD or II or ID or DI. And then they play the pricing game. Okay, so here we're going to illustrate the solution process of the pricing game. I will only focus on the DD structure in this video, okay? Because this is somewhat the most complicated one. If you know how to solve this, then solve the other three should have no difficulty. So, suppose the two manufacturers, they have chosen to use franchise stores, okay? So, they are uh, engaged in this DD structure. Then, for the retailer's problem, in effect, we are solving a bird chain competition. Okay? In the last stage, the two retailers compete by setting prices. And then we can see this is the profit margin, and this is the demand. Okay? It depends on my own price and also the competitor's price. This function is exactly the Birchand competition objective function. At that moment, WI has been fixed by the manufacturer, so it's just a constant. The retailer solved this game. If P1 P2 stars are the Nash equilibrium, we know that we just need to do first order condition and then second order condition to show that it is convex, I mean a convex program, and then the first order condition will be sufficient. And a unique Nash equilibrium can be derived like this. Okay, so that means P1 and P2 star will be the function of W1, W2, and theta. Let's look at this equilibrium retail price for a while. We certainly want to do some verifications before we move on to the wholesale price game. For example, we can see uh, PI star goes up when WI goes up. So that somewhat makes sense, right? If the wholesale price goes up, then my cost goes up and my price will be forced to go up. So that's something. Also, we can see my price will also go up when my competitor's wholesale price go up, goes up. Why? Uh, how about this? If my competitor's wholesale price goes up, then my competitor's price will be forced to, to increase. And when my competitor increases his prices, I have the room to also increase my price a little bit and earn more money from consumers. Okay? That's why my price goes up at my, retail, my competitor's wholesale price. And also, my own wholesale price has a larger effect than my competitor's wholesale price. Okay, two is greater than theta. Makes sense because I care about my supplier's uh, my supplier's wholesale price more. Finally, you probably want to verify that when theta is zero, PI star will degenerate to 
the price in the usual channel pricing game. Okay, if theta is zero, you don't have this term. You don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this at all. So you have one over two plus W I over two. Okay? That's your retail price. That's exactly what we got when we were solving the channel pricing game without competition. Okay, so now uh, let's believe the whole the retail price is correct. Then Plugging that back to the demand function, we can get the equilibrium demands like this. Okay, as a function of wi and the w3 minus i. Again, we may want to do some verifications. If my wholesale price goes up, my demand will go down. Okay, because I'm going to increase my price, or you can just treat wi as your cost. But if my competitor's wholesale price goes up, then my competitor is at a disadvantage. He will lose some demand and I will get some demand. And then my market will go up. Okay, so this uh, can also be explained. Now let's move on to the manufacturer's problem. For the manufacturer, they want to maximize this. And we have QI star now. We plug in that back. So we can see Manufacturer 1 and the 2, they are affecting each other because when I change my wholesale price, that's going to affect your demand. So they want to solve this problem. Again, first order condition, second order condition. If you are patient enough, you can show. This is a concave function. And then we can apply the first order condition to solve W1 and W2 and eventually get this as a function of theta, the only parameter. You probably want to verify this by yourself uh, before the lecture because even though the solution process here is, is very standard, it's quite standard, if you cannot carry the calculations, then you just cannot analyze anything. Okay? Calculations are not important, are not the most important thing, but it is required. So please do some practices by yourself, by go over the or to verify these calculations. So now we have the equilibrium wholesale price. And then we can get the equilibrium retail prices. And then we get the demands and then the manufacturer's ex equilibrium profits. Okay? Of course, we can also get the retailer's equilibrium profits. And if we add them together, we get the equilibrium channel profits. This can all be found as functions of theta. Okay? And it may not be so easy to verify whether this is increasing or decreasing uh, in theta. Or it's also possible that it's sometimes increasing, sometimes decreasing. We don't really know. But if you want, you may definitely verify it. Or simply draw a, a picture or a graph to show what happened to them. So now we know how to solve DD. For ID, DI, and II, we may all find their equilibrium outcomes. Okay? What's re what are we really uh, want to see is the manufacturer's equilibrium profits. Okay? The manufacturer's equilibrium profits. The reason that we care them the most is because when the manufacturer make the channel structure decision, they try to select the channel structure that can maximize its equilibrium profits. Okay, So in the next video, we will see the manufacturer's equilibrium profits will enter the 2x2 two two game matrix of the channel structure game. And then we will be able to know when will the manufacturers choose to be decentralized. Thank you. Okay, so now let's solve the channel selection problem. As we mentioned, the two manufacturers are really want to set their channel structures. Okay, so we somehow say this is the real problem they want to solve. In the channel structure game, there are two players. They make decisions simultaneously, and then 
Each of them has two options or two actions to choose. Integration with a company store or decentralization with a franchise store. And then we have the payoff matrix or the game matrix because we have solved the four pricing games. Okay, so we may collect everything we need to create this 2x2 two two matrix. I have manufacturer 1, manufacturer 2, I, D, I, D. Okay, I can put, I can input those equilibrium profits into these 2x2 uh, two two entries. Now, we are looking at pure strategy Nash equilibrium. You probably want to ask, do we care about mixed stretch or randomized Nash equilibria in this example? Probably no, because the manufacturers just need to make decisions, right? Today, he needs to decide whether to open a company store or let some guy to run the store as a franchise store. This has nothing to be randomized. Okay, somehow it must make a decision. It cannot say, um, I don't know. Tomorrow when I wake up, I will throw a dice and randomly make a decision. That's not going to be the way people really make decisions. Okay, so that's why we don't really care about randomized decisions in general cases. We want to solve for pure strategy Nash equilibrium. So, uh, with data, things are not easy to do a direct comparison, but we may want to look at the two polar cases when theta is 0 or when theta is 1. Technically, in this model, we assume theta should be less than 1, but as you can see, it doesn't really matter in this case, so you may also treat this as just a limiting case, it doesn't really matter. For this case, when theta is 0, you can see that as manufacturer 1, okay, I think about the following. Uh, how about um, is II an equilibrium? Uh, yes, because if we are at II, then no one has incentive to move. Okay, so II is good. For ID, it's not the case, right? Because if I am doing ID as manufacturer 2, I have the incentive to move. Similarly, if it is DD, Retailer 2 has an incentive to move, and so on and so on. And after some investigations, you can see, as manufacturer 2, they don't really care about what's happening to manufacturer 1. Because when theta is 0, this is just two separated channels. Okay, So when this is an isolated channel, the manufacturer will always want integration. So that's why... In equilibrium, we will only see II. However, when theta is 1, things are somewhat different. First, we can see here, II is still an equilibrium. Okay? If they are earning 1 currently, no one has the incentive to unilaterally deviate to D because that's going to give him only 3 over 4. Okay? So II is an equilibrium, but DD is also an equilibrium, and it is quite good, right? In this case, it is quite good. For example, for manufacturer 1, oh, manufacturer can earn 3 under DD, and then 3 is greater than 9 over 4. So that's why manufacturer 1 would prefer DD than ID, and then DD is also an equilibrium. Okay, so for the two polar cases, we can see this. But what's more important is that we know all those payoff functions are continuous in theta. Okay, they are continuous, function, continuous functions of theta. So that means if theta is very close to 1, then we have this. We know dd must be an equilibrium. Because when theta is close to 1 enough, situation will just be similar. The, num the change of numbers will just be limited. Okay, So we can expect there is at least a, in an interval of theta close to 1 in which dd is an equilibrium. 
So let's complete the analysis. Eventually, all we need is a figure like this. Okay, for theta between zero and one, we can depict those functions. For example, for i i, i i is from here to here. When theta goes up, these two products become more similar. The aggregate demand becomes larger, and the profit can go up. Pi i i is the situation is the profit of a single manufacturer when they choose integration and the integration. We can see several things. First, i i is greater than d i. d i is the case. d i is the decentralized manufacturer's profit when the other guy choose integration. Okay, i d is the Integrated manufacturer's profit when the other guy chooses decentralization. Let's compare II and DI first. Because II is greater than DI, always. So DI is never an equilibrium. And II is always an equilibrium. Because if they are choosing II, no one will want to become DI. Okay? No one, manufacturer one does not prefer DI. Manufacturer 2 does not prefer ID. Okay? No one wants to become the single guy who is doing decentralization. So II is always an equilibrium. II is always an equilibrium. There is one number which is a cutoff here. Okay? Around 0.931. When theta is lower than this number, we can see pi id is greater than pi dd. Okay? What does that mean? If pi id is greater than pi dd, then pi dd and uh, then dd is not an equilibrium. Because if they are choosing dd as the manufacturer one, I have the incentive to become the one, the single one that is doing integration. Okay? So under this threshold, 0 0.931, DD is not an equilibrium, and II is the only equilibrium. But if theta is higher than that, then DD is greater than II. So in this case, there will be two equilibria, II and DD. Okay. Finally, there is a very interesting thing here. If we look at this cutoff, which is around 0 0.708. We can see that pi dd is greater than pi ii. Okay, pi dd is greater than pi ii. But ii is the only equilibrium. The only equilibrium. What does that mean? In this interval, these two manufacturers, they know if it is possible, they should do dd. Okay, if it is possible, they should do DD. However, because they are rational, because they are selfish, because they could not, cannot coordinate or cooperate, they will choose II, each one. And then that's a prisoner's dilemma. If they can collaborate, they should choose DD. Unfortunately, they cannot, so they are choosing II. So, within this range, we say they are in a prisoner's dilemma. But if theta is too low or too high, then it's not the case. Okay, so here, let me make a very brief conclusion. When theta is high enough, okay, then dd is an equilibrium. That means dd is possible. dd is a possible outcome. So the insight here, the first insight here we get is if the two products are similar enough, or if the competition is so intense, then decentralization is possible. Decentralization may outperform centralization. Okay, so this is basically the most important insight that the two authors want to deliver to us in this paper. When competition is highly intensive, Manufacturer may want to choose franchise. Manufacturer may want to choose decentralization.
before you look at the next video in which I discuss this insight, please stop here for a while and think about the thing I just mentioned to you. I am saying, or they are saying, when the competition is very intensive, the manufacturers may be better off to choose decentralization. When the competition is very intensive, in equilibrium, they will choose. They may choose decentralization. Try to explain to yourself why this is the case. Why the degree of competition will choose? Well, why the degree of competition may affect the channel structure? Okay. Try to give you some ex explanations, or try to think about this intuitively. After you make some um thinking, after you think for a while, look at the last video. There, I will discuss my understanding of this phenomenon or this claim, and then we can see whether this is true or not. Thank you. Okay, so now let's complete our discussion by uh, talking about the intuitions and the implications. Oh, remember that in the previous video, we made that conclusion or made that statement. When the competition is highly intensive, the manufacturer would choose decentralization. Let's do some discussions. So first, uh, we can see the following. Even though the retailer is not stronger than the manufacturer, a manufacturer may want to do decentralization. Okay. The manufacturer may delegate the sales business to a guy who is not stronger than him. Okay, that means the manufacturer gives away the control of the retail price, and the retailer will do something that is out of the manufacturer's interest. Okay, but the manufacturer is want to do that. The manufacturer want to do that. So what is the incentive for the manufacturer to do that? That's the question we want to ask. Why is that possible? Okay, we observe that this happens when Z is high, which means the products are quite similar, or the competition is quite intensive. Intensive. Why do we say the competition is intensive? It's because um, when Z is high, the other players. Uh, the other player's price, uh, the other player's price, is going to affect my profit a lot, right? When Z is small, his price change has only a very limited impact on my demand. But when Z is high, the two products are just highly um, dependent. So we can interpret Z, the high Z, as an indicator of intense competition. So, <clears throat> for this particular phenomenon, the paper says the following: Manufacturers in a duopoly are better off if they can shield themselves from the environment uh, by inserting privately owned retailers and you automatically the retail market. So, what does that mean? If I am a manufacturer. I can see the competition is so intense because the price is so high. So in that case, it's probably better for me to hide behind somebody instead of standing at the very frontier to compete head by head to head with the other guy. Okay, so let me say that again. The competition is very high. So if I go into that game directly. To compete with someone else, because the competition is so intensive, so I can earn very few money or very little money. But if I choose to delegate the responsibility to some other guy and let that guy to compete for me, then it's possible for me to earn more money. Okay, that's the intuition here. So. You probably think that's reasonable, because no one like intense competition. No one would like to participate in a game with high competition. Here, 
Oh, below, I want to provide some more explanations from the perspective of efficiency. Let's see what's there. So, suppose the manufacturers really become earning more money by doing decentralization. That means the system profit must be even higher. Okay? This is because, um, let me draw a graph. Suppose, this is manufacturer's profit under integration. If under decentralization, the manufacturer earns more, then because the retailer is also earning some profit, so the system profit must be even higher. Okay, So that means decentralization generates a higher channel profit or system profit. If you think about what happened in your previous lectures models, this seems to be impossible. This is saying decentralization is more efficient than integrated system. Why is that possible? Why is that possible? Think of the following way. Suppose currently this is II. If this is II, then the two players are playing the Birchand competition, and therefore the prices are too low. The prices are too low, and the price are just inefficient. If they change to DD, then each channel now has one additional layer, right? And that additional layer is going to drive up the price. And then the price will go back to be closer to the efficient level. And then that's going to make the system more efficient. Okay, the key here is that this is not a monopoly manufacturer. There are two manufacturers. So if there is no retailer at all, the two manufacturers are playing price competition. The price will be too low, lower than the efficient level. Okay, and then if it happens that there are retailers, then the prices will become higher, just like what we have observed in the supply chain pricing game or the channel pricing game. When there is one additional layer, the price will be going up. Okay, So that tells us why do we see this. Because the price can go back to become more efficient. The price will become closer to the efficient level. So that's why the total pie can become larger. The total pie can become larger. If the total pie can become larger, when the two manufacturers do decentralization, then even though the retailer is going to take away something, the manufacturer may still be better off. Okay, This is something that is very important when you want to explain the phenomenon here. Okay because decentralization can be more efficient in this case. The third explanation I want to give to you is about credibility. Think about the following thing. Under pure integration, the prices are too low, right? And the two manufacturers are actually trapped in a prisoner's dilemma. They know the prices are too low. And they also know that if they can collaborate and raise the price together, they are going to be win-win. But even though one of them make a promise to raise the price, that promise is non-credible, right? Because rationally, they have an equilibrium price in mind. So if there is just a promise, then no one is able to really increase the price. And of course, they cannot sign a contract to increase the price together because that's antitrust. Okay, so if they really want to uh, make each other increase the price, they need to do something that will force them to increase the price. How about that? The way they want to do or the way to complete that is to having one additional layer. Okay? Suppose I now have an independent retailer or has a uh, franchise store. 
Okay, if I insert one additional level, I observe it. My competitor also observe it. He will know that I will be forced to increase my price. Then that's a credible signal to provide incentives to the com to my competitor. Okay, the competitor will receive the signal and understand that I am going to increase my price. And then he will be happy because he can also increase the price. And together, these two guys can earn more money. Okay? Of course, uh, this happens simultaneously. Okay? But this can un help you understand why having one additional layer is helpful. Okay? The key is that this additional layer provides a credible signal to the other guy that I am going to increase my price because I have no choice. Okay, so that's the third explanation I want to give to you. There is one thing that I want to address more. Uh, remember our second explanation is about efficiency. I say um, Birch and Gen price is too low. So adding layers, we can drive the price become uh, higher and go back to the efficient level. Okay, that has something hidden there. It's about integration is worse than decentralization. Okay, integration gives we manufacturers profit. Decentralization gives us manufacturers profit and retailers profit. Decentralization is more efficient. Why? Oh. Last time I told you integration is always optimal because if the if everyone can integrate together and make decisions, that cannot be worse than decentralization. Okay? So what I just told you last week and what I just told you two, two minutes ago are somewhat contradictory. But actually they are not. Okay? Both of them are correct because the fact, the true fact is that complete integration is optimal. Okay? What we mentioned last week is that complete integration is optimal. What is complete integration here? If the four firms are all integrated, or we say if the two channels are integrated, then the system is optimal. So how to do that? If manufacturer 1 and manufacturer 2 collaborate and form one single channel, okay? if they cooperate to choose channel structures and retail prices that's going to be the best they may do because the the system is just a monopoly seller okay the system is efficient in that case but when complete integration is impossible okay if the two manufacturers just cannot integrate each other then partial integration may be worse than no integration this is what we mentioned two slices ago. Okay? Partial integration may be worse than no integration. So there were manufacturer, manufacturer, retailer, retailer, customer. What we are saying here is that because the two manufacturers cannot integrate, okay, there is a wall there. They just cannot integrate. So if you partially integrate, then this system is not very good, okay? This system is even worse than no integration, okay? This system is even worse than no integration, and the four companies are making their own decisions. This has also been related to what we mentioned about credible signals, right? If we have this particular format of partial integration, then there is no way for you to send a signal to your competitor to say that you are going to increase the price. Then you two guys will be engaged in a prisoner's dilemma. Everyone is worse off. Okay? But if you let the retailer to make her own business, then you have that signal. Everyone is happy. 
So what we are saying here about partial integration may be worse than no integration is the so-called principle of the second best. Okay, economists they say this phenomenon or the the principle as the principle of the second best. If you can control everything, do it. That's the best you may do. Okay, control everything. But if you cannot control everything, then it may be better to control nothing, or say it in another way. When you cannot control everything, controlling something or controlling all of all those you may control may not be the best. Okay. Sometimes you may want to leave some parts uncontrolled by yourself, just like this case. Okay, think about this principle in your daily lives. When there are something that you cannot fully control, it's quite quite possible that you will choose not to control anything. Okay. That's not because you are lazy. That's because that's going to make the system more efficient. Try to think about this, or Google this principle to see some more examples. Okay, so uh, the model have told us a lot, but there are actually more. For example, when the manufacturer acts to maximize channel profits instead of his own profits. Then D D will be in equilibrium whenever D is greater than zero point seven seven one. Okay, you can see the region under which D D is in equilibrium becomes larger. Um, so that's reasonable because if you care about channel profits, then you add the retailer's part into the manufacturer's part. But for I I is the same thing, right? I I has no retailer, so the line of the curve of I I is still there. But for DD, it simply becomes higher. So DD dominates high I.、Uh, I should say DD dominates DI. Will more likely to happen, and the region becomes larger. So a manufacturer may want to do this when the manufacturer is is kind, okay, or when the manufacturer needs a retailer, or、oh, the following. When the manufacturer can extract all the profit through some coordinating contracts, coordinating contracts will be the topics two weeks from now. Okay, this is some kind of contracts that allows the manufacturer to take out take away everything in a decentralized channel. Anyway, ah, here I just want to remind you or to 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 do a preview, and telling you that. There may be some ways for the manufacturer to take away everything in a channel, in a decentralized channel. If the manufacturer is able to do that, the manufacturer will try to maximize channel profit, and then DD will be more likely to be in equilibrium. Okay, or、well, as we mentioned, when the two manufacturers collude, and that means cooperate, they will always downward integrate because. When this happens, they will always try to control everything. Then complete integration is optimal. Finally, you may have other game structures. Okay, it's very easy to think about some other kinds of game structures. For example, in ID, no, the timing may be different, or there are some other else in the paper. You may want to take a look, but the authors can show. Under some very uh, un just under very limited、uh, assumptions, all those qualitative results will still be there. Okay, DD may be an equilibrium when competition is intense. Okay, <clears throat> now it's time to make some conclusions. We have identified a scenario for the manufacturer to delegate a retailer. Okay, to do decentralization, a manufacturer may want to do so when the competition is intense. Vertical integration may then become suboptimal, and one reason for us to show it, or one reason to make that happen, is horizontal competition. If there is no horizontal competition, 
just like the channel pricing game, then vertical integration is always optimal. But when we have horizontal competition, then the principle of the second best tells us vertical integration may not be optimal. The model is exactly a combination of price competition and the pricing in a supply chain or pricing in a channel. Okay. In game theory, some people call this kind of game as Stegelberg game. This is those games that uh, there is a leader, there is a follower, or it's just a simple dynamic game. Okay. Anyway, you know price competition, you know pricing in a supply chain. Both are not so difficult, and both gives you just intuitive insights. But when you combine both of them to study a more restricted situation, as what I'm wrong, to study a more general situation, you can see now we find something that is more interesting and something that is non-trivial, right? So that's why uh, economic models are interesting, at least interesting to me. So, um, finally, our mathematical results now generate managerial implications. Okay? Manufacturers may want to hide from intense competition, or the manufacturer may want to drive the too inefficient price up to make it more efficient, or the manufacturers may want to incentivize the competitor to increase its price. Okay? To do so, the manufacturer ins inserts a level into its channel to send a signal to the other guy saying that I will increase my price. Okay? All of these are somewhat um, not so easy to be observed or to understand, right? They are really hidden inside the in competition or interaction among all these players. With this model, we are able to really understand uh, what will be the outcome and then really understand something that we did not expect before we really solve the model. Okay, that's something I want to tell you here. Finally, oh, and this is a typo. Principle. Principle of the second best sometimes give you some ideas about how much should you control. Okay, that's the end of the videos. In the lecture, we will discuss related um, issues and give you more direction to understand this result. Thank you.